Opening day for the defense in the trial of an accused cocaine pusher and his gang, a case that illustrates the perversion of the American dream of success in neighborhoods scarred by poverty and challenges the ability of the overburdened U.S. criminal justice system to break the circle of violence, corruption, and addiction. Rita Braver reports. The so-called Grateful Edmund gang arriving for trial. Massive security all around the federal courthouse in Washington, D.C. Stay right there. I'm telling for what the U.S. Right government there. claims is a case that illustrates how new and violent drug networks are springing up all over the country. They're bringing death and destruction to children and to families and to entire communities. The gang allegedly led by 24-year-old Rafael Edmund reportedly sold 1,700 pounds of cocaine a month brought directly from the notorious Crips gang in Los Angeles. Police say the Edmund organization enforced its will with violence, as many as 30 murders. It takes a lot of guts to, uh, to get up on the witness stand and testify against someone who is alleged to be as violent and as dangerous as Rafael Edmonds and his group. In fact, the house of the family of one witness was firebombed after her testimony. Another key witness has refused to testify. Jurors are under 24-hour guard. Their names are kept secret. The whole trial is conducted behind bulletproof glass. Defense attorneys complain. It sends a message that the defendants are dangerous people from whom others need to be protected. But authorities dismiss those concerns and seem more worried about another problem the case demonstrates. What happens when accused criminals like Rafael Edmund become heroes in the community? Actually, he wasn't really the selfish type person. He used to, like I said, you know, he used to take the kids out, you know, get them a little money, take them to McDonald's and stuff like that. Young people are flocking to the trial. We wasn't real close, but he was a friend of mine. As you know, he waved yesterday, and, you know, I'm just, I'm just showing my respect by being down here. I think what most of these young folks are seeing is someone like them who has become very successful in a society where some people, or most people like them, don't have much of a shot at success. Money, the government says drug money, has turned Rafael Edmund and his family into celebrities. His grandmother is tracked by camera crews as she attends the trial in a different ensemble each day. She's not charged in the case, although she owned the house that was allegedly used as gang headquarters. I'm going to break one of those cameras. Money gave Edmund a flashy lifestyle, and money may have also bought the police. Wiretaps played at the trial showed that suspects knew they were under investigation. FBI. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's who's part of it. Huh? That's who's monitoring us now. Meanwhile, the legend goes on. Authorities say they had to move Edmund out of the local jail and into a more secure facility because he was getting special VIP treatment from the guards. Rita Braver, CBS News at the Federal Courthouse in Washington. The crime rate is, of course, still too high. If you think prison is the answer to crime, listen to this startling, even outrageous admission from the U.S. government today. A notorious drug thug known as the Al Capone of cocaine managed to turn his prison cell into the headquarters for a drug ring. Correspondent Rita Braver tells how he pulled it off. Rafael Edmund is the kind of drug kingpin who has terrorized America's cities. In the late 1980s, he ran a violent, multi-million dollar cocaine operation on the streets of Washington. Edmund's lifestyle was so flashy that Georgetown University basketball coach John Thompson had to warn him away from his players. Even while on trial, Edmunds drew adulation from neighborhood kids. I'm just showing my respect by being down here. But his gang was so murderous that juror identities were kept secret and Edmund was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Yet today, federal officials revealed how from the very beginning, taking advantage of prison privileges, Edmund operated another huge drug ring right from inside the federal penitentiary at Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. Rafael Edmund, despite his incarceration, was continuing to deal cocaine using inmate telephones, visitation privileges, and mail privileges. He was calling Columbia by making three-way calls, by calling an associate outside of the prison who would then make a three-way call to Columbia. When an informant exposed Edmund's operation, he in turn agreed to inform on his own network. Thirteen arrests have been made in the last few days. The U.S. attorney took an unusual swipe at the U.S. prison system. Clearly, the Bureau of Prisons has a problem that needs to be dealt with. 
And caught off guard, the Bureau of Prisons tonight claims the Edmonds case is just an isolated incident. Rita Braver, CBS News, Washington. Before he went to prison, Rafael Edmund III, the biggest drug dealer in the history of Washington, D.C., sold some $300 million a year worth of cocaine and crack. After he went to prison, he sold even more. Right here behind the concrete walls, steel bars, and locked doors of this maximum security federal penitentiary in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. Following his conviction as a drug kingpin, Edmund was sentenced to two life terms without the possibility of parole. But within just days of his arrival, he was back in business. He was dealing drugs right from his prison cell. Just about everybody inside the jail in some way, shape, form or fashion is dealing in drugs, either directly or indirectly. He was caught and two years ago struck a deal with the feds. Ever since, he's been telling them exactly how he pulled it off. Tell me what drugs you dealt with in prison. Cocaine? Cocaine. Crack? Crack. Heroin? Heroin. What else? Marijuana. Those, those were the basic four, cocaine, crack, and heroin, and marijuana. <laughs> There's nothing left. <laughs> you did the gamut. Yeah, I did it all. He did it all, and then some. For starters, he brought drugs into the prison through this visiting room. He hired other inmates whose girlfriends, during contact visits, would pass the stuff packed in small balloons. She might kiss him and he put them in his mouth. He, he drank swallowed. a little bit of soda or water, swallow them. She go do it again. Good he's day. got them all inside. He got them all inside. Then when he get back inside the institution, he, he spit them up. What's the most you ever heard of those that any one person that I've seen one person bring. I've yeah. seen somebody bring in like 60 of them. Edmund says prison yeah. officials know this goes on. It keeps the jail mellow. It's keep people patient. You know, they be able to get high and chill. So, so they, so they like this and let these things happen sometimes. Come on. Yeah, that's what they do. He wasn't just selling drugs to other prisoners. He also masterminded the shipment of more than two tons of cocaine and crack from the coca fields of Columbia to the District of Columbia. In some ways, he's like the Babe Ruth of crack dealers. Eric Holder, the Deputy Attorney General of the United States, was, until recently, the top prosecutor in Washington, D.C. It was his office that locked Edmund up in the first place. Tell us the magnitude of his operation from inside the prison. If you look at it on a monthly basis, he was exceeding that which he did when he was running what, to that time, had been the largest drug operation in Washington, D.C. history. He was doing more from in prison? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. At the maximum, at its maximum, he was doing about 400 kilograms of uh, cocaine per month while in prison and while on the street, he was doing about 300 at its maximum. Edmund says it was easy to do from behind bars. Um, I think it's much easier than when you're on the street. Easier than on the street? Much easier because you're right there with the people that have direct access to the narcotics that you need. Colombians, Cubans, Mexicans. All thrown in together. All thrown in together. Thrown in with criminals like Osvaldo Trujillo Blanco, or as Edmund knew him, Chicky, a convicted drug felon. He had a high profile case. I had a high profile case. So, you know, we were just wanting somebody to introduce us. We, we just was waiting for a person coming on and say, this Chicky, Chicky, this Ray. And we yeah. just gonna go from there. It was right there. What, what else? You know, what else? What else could we do? It's, it's right there. Chicky is cocaine royalty, son of Griselda Trujillo Blanco, better known as the godmother of the Colombian drug underworld, and a founding member of the notorious Medellin drug cartel. Does it make any sense to put the biggest guy from D.C. and someone from one of the largest cartels in Colombia? In such close proximity, you'd know it would be inevitable that they'd come together. No, I'm not sure that's true. I wouldn't make that assumption. I would think that both people, having been put in federal prison, um, would have been incapacitated. But they weren't. 
A year after Edmund met him, Chickie was released and returned to his horse ranch in Columbia. And that's when business really took off. So how did you pull it off? I mean, you, you were doing pretty serious and impressive deals. Oh, yeah, from inside, Ma I love maximum security yeah, penitentiary. Maximum security. Specifically, how did you do it? Um, for safety, we would use the beds in the room, the telephones. Specifically, these telephones, conveniently located just down the hall from his cell. Edmund would contact Chickie simply by placing a collect call to a friend in Washington. Every one of those calls was recorded. Hello, this is the AT&T operator with a collect call. Who's calling, please? Right. Will you accept the charge? Uh-huh. The friend, in turn, connected him to Chickie all the way down in Medellin. What reason would I be calling out the country? I'm not from Colombia or South yeah. America. Or here's a, like here's that. an inmate that's calling Medellin three and four times, times a, a week. week. So you know I'm up to something. <laughs> just, just common sense would tell you. If you got good common sense, it would tell you that I'm up to no good. In one afternoon, he made 59 phone calls to five states and two foreign countries. I thought that we listened in on their phone conversations. I thought that when a guy makes a phone call, that, that the prison kind of knows what he's talking about. All the phone conversations, all the social phone conversations are recorded, but not all of them are monitored. Now, does that make any sense? Well, it doesn't make any sense except for the fact that they don't have the ability to. There's simply not enough people to listen in on all the phone conversations that all of these prisoners have. And the prisoners know that. They count on it. Well, I'm sure that's true. But Edmund says he and Chickie weren't taking any chances. They spoke in code. Remember, he used to live in 18th Street. Yeah. Now he was going to move to downtown to 16th Street. To the yeah. When, when, he, when he made that statement to me, he was letting me know that the price went down 3000 and went from 19th Street to 16th Street. So automatically knew what he was talking about. Edmund used an entirely different code when he spoke to his distributors back in Washington, D.C. Believe it or not, he used Pig Latin. You want to hear a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I want to hear what you say. How did you say that? What did you say? Oh, I was just saying, I feel good today. So fast. You could yeah. do that. You, you got to be fast so if somebody, so nobody will understand what you're talking about. Yeah, and you could just do this whole interview like that? Yeah, I could do the whole interview like that. Now, what kind of money were you making out of this? I wasn't making the money that I should be making, but, you know, I was getting 5000 here, 10000 there, which is, which is good money for somebody that's in jail and doing time. It was good money for anyone. $200,000 in two years collected for him by associates on the outside. But the money flow was disrupted when Chickie was gunned down in a Medellin nightclub but only temporarily, because Edmund quickly struck up with another inmate, this time from the Cali cartel. Freddy Aguilera was serving 60 years with no parole, just a cell block away. And you hook up with another Colombian. Yeah, like I told you, the temptation, you know, you got people every day, different people coming to me trying to hook up drug deals, and this is something that I can do and I know how to do. So it was just hard to say, no, I don't want to be involved in it when I can just say, Okay, let me set this deal up and give me a quick twenty or thirty thousand dollars. Prison authorities never did figure out what Edmund was up to, but the FBI and local police here in Washington, D.C. did, thanks to a tip from a jailhouse informant. When the feds went to Edmund with the evidence, much to their surprise, he agreed to cooperate. With his help, the government was able to lock up 15 drug dealers, among them some of the most violent drug thugs in the nation's capital. Why did you decide to cooperate? Because I wanted to, I wanted to put it all behind me. I wanted to, also I wanted to help my family. First of all, that was that was the first thing that gave me the motivation. My mom, my aunt, and my three sisters. His mom, his sisters, brothers, brothers-in-law, and others were all in the family business with Edmund, and are all serving time. His mother and sisters are together at the Alderson Prison Camp in West Virginia. The feds told Edmund they would not recommend a sentence reduction for him. But they agreed to go to bat for his 56-year-old mother, who was sentenced to 24 years in prison for her role in Rafel's drug enterprise. That's my mom. Mm. And, you know, I love her, so, you know, when I miss her, yeah. you, know, you know, I hope she'd be okay. I feel very honored. I mean, he has life, or two life sentence, and he didn't think about himself. He thought about his mother. Constance Bootsy Perry is the unlikely matriarch of Washington's most prominent crime family. 
Before she got locked up, she had a $40,000 a year job in the federal government. So you, you got your kids educated, you made sure they went to church, you had a good job, your ex-husband had a good job. Yeah, he had a job. He worked for the government, too. He worked for the government. You were middle-class people. Yes. He was not raised in the inner city. He lived no. in the suburbs. No. Safe place. Yes. How many of your children are in jail? Six. You had seven kids and six are in jail. Yes. You're in jail? Yes. Come on. What happened? I can't really say, and I think basically I'm in here only because I knew what was going on. She was a mom to me, but also she was a personal friend to me. So when things, you know, selling drugs, like I told you before, so many things go wrong. People get killed, people lose their jobs, people get strung out. And whenever things go wrong or things don't go right in my life, she was my friend. I go talk to her and tell her about all these things, about what's going on with me. And she knew about all that. And she ended up telling all the things that I told her to an informant on a wiretap, and, and that made her be part of the conspiracy. Well, it was more than that. Bootsy admits she once counted her son's drug money, and she accepted a car, a house, and other gifts purchased with his drug proceeds. My mother always wanted a nice big house, you know, so I wanted to be able to buy that for her one day. She always wanted a Mercedes. I wanted to be able to buy that for her. When Edmund was a child, both his parents sold drugs. The father, allegedly heroin. Bootsy says she sold diet pills and admits she sometimes had Rafel handle the money. But she blames his friends for getting him into the drug trade. He saw the fast money or he saw them driving big cars and he, they, he said, hey man, how did you do this? How did you get this? Yeah. The money. Yeah, the money. Or greed. Just say greed. I'd say greed. This is your watch. Yeah, it used to be my watch. Used to be your watch. Yeah, the government watch. now has this watch. Yeah, the government owns it now. How much did this watch cost? Oh, close to 100000 Was this typical of what you would buy yeah, when you were... typical things that I would buy when I was home. Well, you were fancy. Yeah, I was, I was real jazzy. Yeah, I like, I like, you know, try to have a lot of class. Did you wear a lot of diamonds on your fingers? No, I wasn't. And... I, wasn't I just had one carat. I just had a 10-carat diamond ring. Oh. A 3-carat for my ear and just a, a diamond chain to match the watch. It's very simple. Yeah, just, you know, simple, but... Stand out. Stand Today, he's trying not to stand out. So the feds have put him in a little-known witness protection program for convicts. He lives under an alias in a different prison, where it's hoped those he betrayed won't find him. But if he's hiding out, why is he talking to us? He says he wants the kids in Washington, D.C., who see him as a hero, to know that what he did was wrong. A lot of my friends from my neighborhood lost their lives because I brought drugs in the community. You know, the crack people babies. died. The, crack yes, babies? Some babies probably was born from crack because of me. Yeah, I feel bad about that now, but back then, you know, I was, I was just thinking about the power. We tried to ask the Bureau of Prisons what they're doing to prevent prison drug dealing, but they refused to comment. So we asked their new boss, Eric Holder, who has not yet had a role in making prison policy. As a result of the rayful incident, uh, a task force was created to really look uh, at the whole system and decide what we could be doing. It's been two years since you first found out about this. Not you, I mean the Bureau of Prisons, sure. the government, the Justice Department. It's been two years, and from what I'm hearing, the problem really has not been fixed yet. I think that's right. You're saying that it's remotely possible that as we're sitting here, somebody in some prison's making a phone call and setting up a drug deal somewhere. Yeah, I think that's remotely possible, but I think we're also going to be in a position real soon to say it's not possible. Do you think that's going on today, right now? I'm quite sure it is, yeah. People are sitting in prison making drug deals, yeah. And they, you know, you're sitting there, you have nothing to do, and everybody needs money, and they love money, so I'm quite sure that it's going on right now. In fact, the Bureau of Prisons may have made it even easier. When the FBI began its investigation of Rafael Edmond, there were three phones on his cell block, and inmates could use them every other day. Today, there are four phones, and prisoners can use them every day.